Yes. So, I would like to welcome you to our next session. We will have three items before we have the breakout. First, we will start out with the Multiservice Networks panel in a little moment. After that, we will hear about some Asian network design. And then, finally, we will have lightning talks in the end. So, but first, we will, for the next half hour, try and discuss the demands on multiservice network operations. Yes. So, first, let me introduce my panelists here. First, I would like to tell you about how we will do this panel. It will mainly be like a question, and I will pass a question, and we will have the panelists answer. And we would like the audience very much to, if you have any questions, go to the microphone and pass them as we go along. There will not be a question and answer session in the end. We want the questions within, so it may turn out to be some interaction. But for my first question to my panelists is, so who are you, and why is it relevant for you to be on a multi-service networks panel? Let's start with Ted. Hello, I'm Ted Seeley. I work at Sprint. Why am I up here on a multi-service panel? Because we deliver multiple services over our network, or we carry multiple services primarily, signaling, voice, also some voice data. We do wholesale termination, VoIP termination, carry some broadcast video for some people, customers. So that's why I'm here. Okay. Joe? Joe Provo, ITA Software. More from an enterprise kind of perspective, yet still servicing a niche industry, as you will, in the travel space. Multi-service. Crazy, crazy legacy protocols twisted to live on IP. Lots of packet mangling through firewalls. Voice and video conferences with customers and such like. And Chris? I'm Chris Luke. I'm from EasyNet, um, long time sort of traditional ISP. Um, what I'm trying to bring to this panel is the fact that in the last few years we've been doing a lot more live broadcast video, um, lifeline services such as for um, fire stations in the UK, um, and how we've migrated from being that kind of traditional um, six modems in a closet ISP to the current sort of multinational multi service network that we do now. Thank you. And finally, Walt. Good afternoon, um, or howdy, as we say at Texas A&M University. Um, I, I come to this in the enterprise perspective as well, but uh, really, again, more of the end user. And um, at A&M, at along with running the operational network, I also uh, direct the, next, the, the Internet 2 research labs, where we're really focusing our work right now in four different delivery of four different services, um, being IPTV, which, of course, has got a significant multicast component behind it, um, SIP peering between universities, which of course basically has got all of your RTP type um, re requirements. Building control systems, uh, we're working on a project with NIST, the National Institute of Standards and Technology, in allowing external first responders to interface with building control systems. And again, that really has more of a latency component to it. And then uh, we've also been part of the next generation 911 deployment, which really ultimately migrates all emergency communications, and cl communications, including what police, fire, ambulance, 911 call centers, and public entities that have their own first responders, such as universities, are doing to um, create again one network that does everything instead of having the multiple silo networks. Well, thank you. So, yeah. I put down a few keywords of what people have been saying here. Uh, they probably said a little bit more, but this is just for your information if you ever review the slides later. So the overall question that uh, this panel is trying to discuss is uh, what challenges, what new challenges do we have operating a multi-service network? And I'm trying to put it out in a few more questions, that more specific questions, but if you guys have any other questions, please come up and, and say them. Um, the first I would like to 
you to discuss is network tuning. Like what additional demands to multiple services put on your network and what measures do you take to meet the additional demands if you take any? And who want to go first? Yeah, I would like Chris to start. <laughs> so, uh, one of the areas that we found that was, uh, that, was, that was critical was having a lot of very well-defined infrastructure on your network to be able to support the services you intend to do. For instance, having a well-defined cause model that is implemented at the edge in the, cure, in the core, uh, making sure that uh, all of your deployment models know how to use this, uh, many scripts use it. Um, uh, we use EXP bits with MPLS, for instance, and making sure that your behaviors are accurate and reflect the, the stuff that you're selling. Um, we carry everything over MPLS, for instance. Um, it makes it a lot easier to deploy newer services. Um, and, and though we run an uncongested network, cause is still important because you do have to consider failure scenarios, for instance. Um, one of the issues that we've had, though, for instance, is validating router features. For instance, we have a, a mostly Cisco network, a variety of platforms, but not all the iOSs are created equal. You have to have a very um, rigorous um, validation of the software you're going to use. Um, and we have a, a six-month software roadmap cycle that we validate features for. And we know which version we're going to have at that point somewhere in the future. Okay. That's interesting. So who would like to follow up? I'll, I'll take it next on that one. Um, you know, every time we bring a new application to the network, again, as we go through the third or fourth round of convergence, you know, and obviously we all started off with data, and that was pretty straightforward. And I think our guys knew how to do that pretty well. Started adding video conferencing, and all of a sudden our data folks are suddenly introduced into this concept of jitter. And, you know, what do we, what do, we do with it? How do we manage, manage and control it? And then, of course, IPTV added the whole aspect of uh, multicast and now with the NG 911 stuff, it looks like we're adding IPv6 to the mix as well as greatly enhancing the requirements for security. So in every one of these cases, oh, and building control systems, they've been a whole challenge all into themselves, again, not only for security reasons, but most of them are kind of designed around, you know, IBM SNA type architectures where it's a polling system, which is very, very, very latency sensitive. And if you don't have all of that controlled, in essence, things start to crater pretty quickly. So in every case, it's been a matter of responding, figuring out what the application wants and needs, and then trying to figure out how to fine tune your network to be able to, um, to support it so you don't end up in a situation where the applications guys are saying, if your network didn't stink, we'd be fine here. And then the guy, network guy is saying, well, if your application wasn't poorly designed, we wouldn't have issues either. So uh, we, we mainly end up doing, uh, be, being the Switzerland here, trying to do negotiations between, between the two sides to try to, try to come up to a, to a reasonable middle ground. But for the most part, I would like to say it's been very proactive and very um, you know, preemptive. But the reality is that um, it breaks and we figure out how to fix it. I'd like to add one thing here, but from an operational aspect, um, <clears throat> one of the things you see uh, quite often is when you roll a new service out, new product offering, whatever, you'll often have your salespeople uh, selling SLAs that your operations people know nothing about. Uh, it's quite a common problem. So that's one of the largest demands you have is to make sure when your salespeople go out there and sell something that your ops people understand what it is they're supporting. Uh, one of the places this is really becoming prevalent is with all of the promised new Ethernet services. You know, we all hear Ethernet, Ethernet, Ethernet everywhere, um, but SLAs don't exist yet for Ethernet services. It's, uh, it's, it's kind of interesting, at least here in the States. Um, so that's one of the big challenges we're seeing these days is how do we actually, may, how, how do you marry up the SLAs for Ethernet services that you're selling from Ethernet services you're buying? And uh, it's quite a challenge. And uh, I kind of laughed at Joe when he said we have to throw layer two out there, but he's absolutely right. Um, it's funny how everything comes back around. Uh, <clears throat> so that's a big challenge uh, from an operational perspective, huge one. And uh, a lot of the comments, <laughs> a lot of the comments from Walt could have been straight from straight from my day job. <laughs> we have uh, we have a lot of since we carry a lot of uh, what some might consider unusual protocols, uh, the uh, second and third order effects of, of data loss or, or delay becomes apparent in real world effects of lack of, uh, 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 you know, lack of seat availability for somebody booking a flight. <laughs> that's, 
that winds up being real dollars. So we have very strict, very strict SLAs, similar to uh, similar to what Ted was describing, and uh, and we have even even compared to strict ISP change control, we have an extremely strict change control policy where um, disruptives are only so many are only allowed so many months apart. Um, you know, lots of uh, lots of uh, the change control management staff having to approve everything, several executives, so on and so forth, for every change. It's uh, quite a different environment than an ISP environment in the operation side that way. Yes. Uh, you kind of jumped a little bit ahead of uh, some of my questions, <laughs> starting with the change control. I was looking more also into, like, the specific technical tuning of uh, your protocols. Do you have any additional demands or is it just business as usual? Uh, the uh, doing, doing accelerated spanning tree stuff, uh, having to go down vendor specific um, layer two, as much as I hate it, vendor specific layer two tuning just to uh, make the meet some of the availability guidelines. Um, we migrated a bunch of um, internal uh, payload traffic to multicast, so while you can easily detect jitter in a, in a, in a video or audio stream as it's happening, um, I had to educate a lot of the engineers about actual, actual uh, you know, packet level uh, testing and RTT uh, monitoring for that sort of thing. Okay, thank you. In a I think in that space, I think there's still a whole lot of work that can be done that would really make a, thing, make a lot of things a lot easier. You know, for example, from what I've seen, I, I have yet to see a reliable, reasonable um, multicast tool that in essence really took it right up to the multicast level across multiple vendors, multiple environments, so where you actually understood when all of a sudden, for example, uh, join on a, on a remote network suddenly no longer worked. So what happens now is when all of a sudden services start to fail, it ends up with a ma lot of manual troubleshooting that literally can take, you know, hours and hours of trying to figure out where along the process, um, where, where along the process the thing is cratered um, with that type of thing, basically. Hopefully, um, ho hopefully we'll see some reasonable tools coming out in that space. Might not be as much of an issue for, for the carriers in that they, in essence, really control the entire multicast within their entire, entire network. I think that's a discussion we had a little bit earlier today. Um, whereas you start to, you know, doing things like multicast across multiple multiple networks and multiple vendors or multiple carriers, because in essence most of our stuff is kind of a five-layer hierarchy where you've got university, regional network, national network, and then a regional network in the university. So we're dealing five five control planes and five control domains to go from end to end and trying to troubleshoot in that type of world is pretty tough. I think ultimately, though, that's probably where Hopefully, most services will ultimately end up going. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? No. Uh, right. So I put up a slide now with the tools of trade. With uh, is actually some of the um, the things that were mentioned here for for network tuning. Um, I noticed that. You didn't talk much about quality of service. That's one of the things that I have been thinking that at introducing more different kind of services with different kind of requirements for the for the traffic would implement would would make you want to use quality of service from my little naive point of view. Um, do you have any comments on that? Are you using quality of service for helping out? I'll speak to that for a second. <clears throat> So you're going to break it down into two categories, your internal customer set, which in this case would be, for us, would be our, our wireless people or our internal network control people, uh, and then there's the external segment, which is the customer base. Customers, of course, want quality of service, mostly on the enterprise segment in the VPN world, and yes, we use quality of service there uh, very heavily, um, customizable pretty, pretty much to whatever the customer wants. Uh, <clears throat> internally. When the control network says we move more and more, all of those move more and more towards the packet domain, then we'll, we will ultimately have to roll out quality of service in the core of the network, which is not really what we want to do, right? Because you want to get two choices, right? You can forward packets or you can count packets, but you can't do both. Um, and we're headed that direction, ultimately, there's no way around it. Um, 
it's just it's just reality as the convergence continues to happen. Uh, but the answer is yes. But in terms of all the other buzzwords, you want to try and keep it simple because you got to operate it right. Not a, you yeah. know, we can't all maybe we all came from the knock, but we all don't want to go back and work on the knock, right? Uh, so the answer is yes. But the other thing you do is you do a lot of logical overlays. And, and one thing that's missing here, and I thought I said it is, is one of the tricks of the trade is, is use private addresses in your network to your advantage, right? Because you can veil things that way very easily, right? And it's kind of everyone says you're not supposed to do that, but we all do that. So, yes. Yes. Does that answer your question? It does. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, we're, we're also... I'm also kind of hoping that hopefully within the next year, year and a half, as the wireless carriers start to roll out IMS and we really start to see the ability to, um, in essence, one of the inherent advantages of IMS is that it has the ability to honor, um, honor QoS parameters from one carrier's network to another carrier's network. Now, whether or not that actually ends up being deployed that way or being implemented that way is yet to be seen, but for the first time, I think we've got a capability that looks pretty awesome, not only to be able to go from carrier A to carrier B, but also go from carrier A to carrier B to enterprise A to enterprise B as well. So um, for the first time ever as the enterprise, we're kind of being being considered as part of the network instead of this, this thing sitting outside of the cloud, if it happens. If it happens. <laughs> yeah. Any questions from the audience at this point? No. Okay. So, Joe, you were, no. Sorry, that was a little too early, but I was thinking monitoring. Um, I know the monitoring systems that we use in our network is, is mostly reactive systems. Um, do, you, do you see you have new demands and you need new monitoring tools for these services? Yeah, um, I started to allude to it before that there's that that there's um, seeing uh, we see cascading effects when there's errors on the network that translate into the the, the bread and butter of the uh, of the applications um, so <clears throat> we've had to do a lot of uh, monitoring built into the applications to allow um, them to actually to, to actually have signaling within the system in addition to just our standard NMS and have been working on coupling some of the uh, specific feedback loops that we have in that in that area in addition to standard like uh, automated RTT monitors um, doing trying to get more uh, uh, deployment of iperf and, and, and doing like some uh, test runs with um, trying to roll out BW Bandwidth control, the remote bandwidth control tool, as a good multicast test bed, like you were saying, because there's not a lot of uh, useful diagnostics there in in the vendor space. Okay, Chris. In that same light, too, you know, we've been looking desperately for again for years for reasonable tools that will deal with application, you know, looking at the application side of it as well, because like I said. Be, between the video guys and the data guys, for years we've had battles. Well, the same thing with the application side of it. Um, for years, the application guys have been saying, "Well, if your net if your network didn't stink, my application would be running fine." And the network guys are going, "Well, if your application was properly tuned, it wouldn't be an issue as well." So, being able to again to find some refereeing tools to sit in the middle of that would be great. So one of the things that we're trying to do is get more involved in some of the, the data we're transporting. For instance, with live video with broadcast traffic, we're actually uh, controlling the codecs at either end of the link, and they provide in-band data on the performance levels, how many frames have been dropped, the jitter, and so on. And we have a section of our NOC dedicated to monitoring this during live transmissions to make sure that it's within a certain set of parameters. And if it isn't, they have the big red phone to the various other parts of the operations um, department to make sure that those issues get resolved quickly. Um, it's one of those things where if, if there's a major spawning event on, you don't want your screens to freeze because people start losing jobs when that happens. My two cents worth, literally. Um, <clears throat> so, in, in speaking from the big carrier perspective, in the big carrier world, if it's critical, you still do it in twos. So there's you always redundancy, full time, 100% backed up, et cetera, et cetera. Um, from the customer perspective, some of them do that. Uh, when it comes to voice termination and VoIP termination primarily, uh, 
the operations reaction times are still not good enough. Um, the, the problem is when you when you when you come from the internet space and you run a packet network and you're just doing the big big internet, which is cool, and then you start putting all these real services on it, your operations staff don't transition that quickly to that, and and so the reaction times aren't always as quick as you'd like to see. Um, the understanding of maintenance activities, uh, making sure that you metric up certain links out of service before you do your access to your maintenance evolutions and, 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 and cleanly and easily shift traffic back and forth still is lost on people because they come from the world of, oh, we have two of everything, it's sonnet, it's protected, et cetera, et cetera. It's not true necessarily anymore. So that, that proactive monitoring isn't really there that you wish is, would be there. It'll get there, right? And the reality is this is all pretty new stuff still. Uh, we're only talking, what, five years for most of the stuff, if that. So um, video hasn't been riding over the Internet for five years in, in broadcast quality. So we'll, we'll get there, but it's not there yet. So there's, there's a lag is, what, I guess, what I'm really saying. Yeah. Okay. I think it's common. So going from the uh, monitoring room nice all to... Sorry? Nice segue. <laughs> yeah. Going from the monitoring over to the change management, I think Joe was mentioning it a little bit, uh, and you also. I mean, can you, can you elaborate more <coughs> about how you're tightening your procedures? I mean, if you're running a video over over the, the network, there's big events. Change management controls have changed drastically. The, the days of everyone having enable will go ahead and log in and change whatever you want are gone. Um, the change management procedure is very, very, very rigorous, usually two to three weeks now. Uh, what used to be a day, hey, I'm going to bounce this guy tomorrow night, all right, you know, that's gone. Uh, and in the, the number of what you, what you call national events where no changes to the network are allowed seems to be doubling every year. I don't know why, um, but it is. Um, so, yeah, there's – and the, the last bullet, is there such a thing as a maintenance of evolution with no customer impact? Uh, yes, there is, if everything works perfectly. Yeah. Um, n nine times out of ten, it doesn't, you know, and someone always forgets to notify somebody or they didn't read the email it is usually what happens, right? You know, and and, it, and then that, and we all know the net result of that. Yeah. So. Okay. Chris. I think Chris. Has yeah. Chris. So, as part of the um, fire control service that we're um, currently running out in the UK, one of the requirements that EADS had for us was ISO 20, 27001 um, compliance, which is scary ISO stuff. Uh, mostly, it's procedural, but it's talking about explicit management controls over change on your network. Uh, who has access, when do they have access, under what circumstances, who needs to sign it off, um, and in what sort of timescales. Um, but additionally, there's a, a huge customer focus in change control. How many of your top customers need to give positive feedback before you can make a change? Um, one of the issues there then is that you then have to negotiate early when your change windows can be with a particular kind of customer. If that customer is live and four continents at the same time, they're going to be very picky about when you can make changes that affect their service. Um, and, and again, about the, ever, uh, the no customer impact, it's, it's a risk thing. Um, the people who make changes have to be able to evaluate the risk that a change has and the change control on your management and everybody else have to come to an evaluation on can we make this change and when can we make it? I, uh, I had mentioned before a bit about some of the um, more strict CM rules that exist. Uh, we, we also have tightly uh, tight customer notification integration um, similar to Chris. We, we have to do a lot of uh, aggressive, positive acknowledgement versus just fire off the email and hope they read it. Um, a, lot of, um, a lot of negotiation for timing, uh, the multi, uh, with, with specific customers, uh, multi-executive uh, 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 level of approval, I believe I mentioned, and, uh, and we have, instead of uh, increasing number of national events, we tend to have uh, freezes based around uh, big travel holidays since we're travel oriented and that kind of gets in the way of actually getting a lot of work done sometimes. Well, again, from the university side, um, uh, the reality there is we, we just kind of adopt the best practices of the carriers, and we're probably a few years behind you guys in terms of most implementation, but the, one of the major changes that we've seen over the last few years is that um, more and more educational institutions are becoming multinational. So, for example, we've now got a campus in Qatar as well. 
as soon as you start all of a sudden opening up campuses in the Middle East and things like that, now you're dealing with 10-hour time zone differences and different days that they actually take their weekend than we do. So our opportunities for extended maintenance outages and stuff like that, things for server updates and everything else, has almost gone away. So it's gotten to be, it's getting to be more and more of a challenge to try to figure out when the service is, when is your downtime. It's almost getting to the point where the downtime is never. Okay, thank you. At this point, I would like to see, to hear if, did we cover everything that you guys need to know or want to know about running multi-service networks? Apparently we did. I have a second, last question, though, and that is about the future. How do you guys look at the future? Do you think that, can we continue this, what we're doing right now, just putting on another new service that has different demands from the other services on the IP network, or do we have to change that sometime? I think for the foreseeable future, the answer is yes. I, you know, the vendors that supply the equipment seem to be able to, have kept up to this point with the demands, and it seems like we have another paradigm jump in technology heading down, or coming our way in the next 18 to 24 months, which will help that even further and further. So probably the answer is yes. As long as the, it's really more an expectations management game, right, where we're basically taking a protocol that wasn't designed for this and forcing it to do a lot of things that it wasn't designed to do. And it doesn't always work the way we expect it to. Yeah, I was going to say that vendor support is one of the key issues, especially if you're trying to keep it homogenous across your entire network. But additionally, we're talking about quas issues where there may come a point where it's just not cost effective to use quas ports in the core of your network. And if you need to run congested ports, you won't be able to run it over the same network. Simple as that. From our aspect, the real-time traffic in the high bandwidth traffic, such as grid computing and links to the large hadron collider and CERN and stuff like that, are going to have to coexist because we can't afford to build separate networks. Much as it would be nice, much as it would be convenient, it's not going to happen. We have a question. Have you seen the CM process go from speak now or forever hold your peace to everyone must check off the box? Yes. Next, would you like router vendors to quit talking about bits per second and start talking about packets per second? Sorry, I didn't. Would you like the router vendors to quit talking about bits per second and start talking about packet processing per second? Many of them do. That definitely matters to me. In question of the final point here on the future and traffic growth and so forth, I think yes, the real-time services can, and so far they do coexist on my network pretty well. And to Walt's point, they have to. We can't duplicate infrastructure. It's just not economically feasible. Okay. So I think, any final words? Okay. I think this was the end of the Multiservice Network panel, and I would like to thank you all for coming up here and discuss it. I found it really interesting. I hope the audience did as well. So we are about ready for our next session. So I am going to have to ask, sorry, Jeffrey Clayton from PACnet, there you are, to come up here. Thank you.